for the last two weeks, dental floss has been dinner table discussion. Ever since news broke that there's no scientific proof that it actually works, now a Winnipeg researcher has uncovered a new concern that shows in some cases flossing itself is the problem. With more on that, we welcome Dr. Anastasia Kalakis Chalakis, a periodontist and a professor at the University of Manitoba. Doctor, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Have you ever heard so many people talking about flossing in this country? I know it sort of comes in waves, but ever since that first story broke, it seems that people are now talking about this, this idea that perhaps flossing isn't good for you. Uh, there's no proof that it works. Yes, I, it's been a topic of conversation in, uh, in the prairies as well. So I think it's all across the country. Walk me through this aggressive gum disease you were seeing in your patients. What was causing it and why? Well, the, the case series that we published in the uh, Journal of the American Dental Association, uh, we had four patients that had long-standing red, swollen, bleeding gum tissue with um, loss of bone. And uh, they were not responding to conventional therapy, such as um, the brushing and flossing that they were doing at home, the professional deep cleaning that they were receiving in the periodontal office, and uh, the antibiotics. And, you know, one of them had gum surgery. Mm. Um, and those four patients had three things in common. First of all, they all had impeccable oral hygiene. In fact, three out of the four were dental health care professionals. We had two dental hygienists and a dentist. Wow. Um, so they really were very, very aware of what they should be doing. Uh, they all were using a, a waxed um, or coated dental floss on a daily basis or even two times a day. And in their medical history, they all, all four had tendencies towards allergic reactions. So they had a history of eczema, contact dermatitis. Um, one of them had the latex allergy. So um, all, out of all of those patients, those were the three common characteristics. Were these, was this a random sample of people or did you uh, find these people that had gum issues and then analyze it? Well, as, as a specialist, I tend to see people with gum issues. So they, they were people that they, they came to me. So the three dental professionals self-referred and the, the, the original patient who was the fourth patient who was not a dental professional was my, my first patient where I noticed this. So it hmm. took me longer on her to, to diagnose, and then I, I was able to apply my findings to the others that came on later. So, so when you saw that their gums were diseased and, and rotting away, did you know immediately, all right, we have to stop flossing. The flossing could be the issue here. No, no, we didn't, because in the beginning, uh, we did everything we could to treat the gum inflammation and the bone loss, and it was, in fact, very frustrating. It took a period of time. So we performed biopsies on two of the, the four patients, and the biopsies um, showed us uh, similar features of inflammation, but the way the, the, bi the cells were on the biopsies, it was suggestive to a contact allergic reaction. And we had seen this finding in other patients that were associated with, uh, with chewing gums, toothpaste, mouthwash, some food and flavorings. Mm. And we, we made them discontinue those, but despite them um, not having any contact with any of those products, there was no resolution. So the floss was our last, you know, it, it was sort of a leap of faith, and it was our last ditch effort to see, you know, if they stopped flossing, would that help? What happened when they stopped? Well, it was really interesting. First of all, they didn't want to because <laughs> try convincing oral health care professionals not to floss <laughs> yeah. anymore. It wasn't a given. Right. So it took, it took on their, you know, it was really counterintuitive. So from their point of view, you know, we had to convince them to, to, to give this a try. And however, because of the biopsy findings, um, you know, we, we were able to convince them to stop and they substituted the floss with interdental brushes, little brushes that they used. Mm. And the fascinating part is that within three months, it was already a significant improvement. Were you surprised when you saw that initial improvement? I mean, yes. like you said, <laughs> they, they all specialize in, in teeth and, and, and dental hy uh, hygiene. And here you say, hey, don't do something that for so many years we've, we've told people to do. And all of a sudden you see some improvement. 
Well, I think uh, the surprise was all around. I, I, I was very surprised to see the improvement, um, and the improvement continues up to a year later. I mean, this is the, the really fascinating part, is that the, the tissues are continuing to improve uh, with, with every subsequent visit. So how common is this hypersensitivity to, to floss? And is it all floss? Well, th- this is this is really you know a very important point that I want to get across. We suspect that this is rare um, because first of all, it has never been published before. And if you look at the patients, so this was this was our private practice patients, and in our clinic we have about twenty four thousand patients, plus the referrals we get from outside. So out of that whole sample of patients, we have only identified these four, and there's an additional two now that we have also identified that weren't reported. Because because they're more recent, they're more recent patients. So, um, so out of the numbers, if you look at the the numbers, um, we we are aware that this may not be very common. Um, we know, however, of what the presentation. So now we we you know are very much aware of the presentation, the clinical presentation, and over time there might be more patients that come to light. But um, it, I, I would compare it to any kind of other. Allergy. Um, not not everybody, you know, can't eat peanut butter sure. or nuts, right? So it it we don't have the exact number because, as I said, this is the first the first published uh, published case series on it, Doc- uh, and more research needs to be done. Doctor, do you know what it is in that dental floss that is irritating the gums? Unfortunately, not, and that that's you know something that we would like um, down the road um, to to have more information on because uh, there are two issues here. Num- number one, we don't have a list of ingredients, so it's it we can't easily test because we don't know what we're testing for, and we also know that formulations change over time. Right. So there are different ingredients that may be added or removed. So therefore, again, this is over a period of time, so it's hard hard to know. Uh, all we knew is that the you know the removal of the wax dental floss or the coated dental floss gave us a resolution of the of the inflammation. If this turns into a bigger problem, if more people come forward and say, you know what, I have a similar issue. My gums are uh, inflamed, and I don't know what's causing it. Perhaps dental floss manufacturers down the road might have to start putting ingredients on their packaging. Is that something that you might be pushing for? I think I think that would be a great idea, both for for as a benefit to the public, and also for researchers to be able to do future investigations, uh, is to have a listing of the ingredients in the dental floss. And uh, you know, I'd like my patients to be aware of what you know they're using in their mouth. And um, when changes do occur, which is also very important, if changes do occur because there is a new line of product that's made available to the public, is again to be aware of what changes take place and those ingredients to be to be uh, made available both to the public and the profession. Where do you stand on flossing in general? I mean, I mentioned off the top that there was a story, I think two weeks ago, that suggested mm-hmm. there's no evidence that flossing actually helps. Now we have this story, this groundbreaking story, that you know some people are being irritated by dental floss. I mean, there you go. There's two stories against the mm-hmm. practice of flossing. Where does that leave people like yourself? Well, you know, I, I still advocate floss to my patients. Um, we do have, and, 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 you know, it's really interesting to read things um, a little bit, you know, with a critical mind. I can talk about periodontal disease because that's my area of expertise, and, and that particular paper you're referring to talked also about caries. But I'll, I'll give you my take on the periodontal disease aspect. Sure. We, we have evidence, and we know for sure that plaque, when plaque accumulates on the teeth, you get a type of inflammation that's called gingivitis. So you get bleeding gums. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, you know, very, very well proven. Um, we know that toothbrushing alone does not remove all the plaque from the tooth surfaces. And it, the issue is the removal of plaque in between the teeth. We also know that out of all the population that gets gingivitis, a certain percentage of the population will develop periodontitis, which is a gum disease um, that you lose bone with. Um, you can lose your teeth because of a progressive bone loss. Therefore, um, the, the connection between plaque removal and 
gum disease um, is, is, has not been proven with the use of floss. However, we have the connection between the presence of plaque and inflammation. So we need to remove the plaque, and one of the tools that we use to remove the plaque is floss. In a very small segment of the population, there might be an allergy to floss. Uh, one of our a study subject, uh, one of the dental hygienists, does use floss. She just doesn't use wax or coated floss. She uses plain floss right. in areas where she can't reach with the brushes. So floss has its uses, uh, and I would not say that you shouldn't floss. If you have signs and symptoms that are of a concern, such as constantly bleeding gums that uh, are not responding to dental cleanings, um, to uh, oral hygiene measures at home, you should talk to your dentist, and in collaboration with a periodontist or an oral pathologist, that should be investigated to see whether you do have an allergy. And that's the big, uh, and that's the big takeaway from this new development, this new story, the fact that, look, if your gums are infected and you do everything everything you're told to, then perhaps now we now know that perhaps it could mm-hmm. be because of the floss. Correct. We'll leave it there. That's Excellent. all the time we have. Uh, doctor, thank you for taking the time and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I will see where the story goes. I mean, I'm sure there will be more studies, more developments in the flossing world. Yes, yes. I hope uh, we have the chance to, uh, to do more research on this. And I thank you very much for inviting me in your show today. All the best. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.